Hello and welcome to the third episode of this short lecture series on Janet Winters and the Passion. A couple of notes before we start. Um, there is a WordPress uh, link that you need to consult regarding this course on the novel and the other one on modern poetry. Um, we'll go to undergraduatemodules.wordpress.com. There you find three pages to relate to the two courses that we uh, cover in this year, this semester. Um, click on each one of them and at the bottom you find a space where you can leave your comments and questions. All right, so in this part I will talk about the encounter between Henri and Villeneuve and at the same time I'll try to respond to the questions I asked at the end of my previous lecture. Off we go. Well, the first page of part three, titled The Zero Winter, sets the tone of the narrative. We are in Moscow during freezing winter. Bonaparte has led his army on a crusade against the Russians. The campaign we know from historical records not only was a big fiasco, but it caused death and suffering on a large scale. Tens of thousands of French and Russian soldiers died in the series of battles fought in the year 1812. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Russian civilians were dislocated from their towns and villages. They lost their homes and crops and were forced to die in the freezing cold outside. Napoleon's efforts to invade England came to no avail, and facing the threat of the Third Coalition, he focused his attention on defeating his foes on the Continental Front, East Europe. Quote from the novel on page 79. Henri says, We never did invade England. We marched out of Bolin, leaving our little barges to rot and fought the Third Coalition instead. We fought at Ulm and Austerlitz, Elo and Freinland. We fought on no portions. Our boots fell apart. We slept two or three hours a night and died in thousands every day. Two years later, Bonaparte was standing on a barge in the middle of the river Hagen the Tsar, insane would never have to fight again. End of quote. These battles fought in the year 1805-1807 against the Austrians, the Russians and the British were part of Napoleon's strategy to isolate England and bring the entire European continent under his authority. The Russian campaign was the most important piece in the Jacks Hall. But it proved to be the most brutal and the most spectacular catastrophe in Napoleon's military history. After initial and quite indecisive battles, Napoleon was forced to pull out his army from Russia um, to, the Polish, or to the Polish border. But he suffered heavy losses from the scarcity of food and supply, from the abysmal weather condition and from his desperate Russian enemies. Of his 600 thousands army, the Grand Armée, we are told barely some 27,000 soldiers came out of the battlefields in tatters. In this grim and chaotic environment, Henri, a valiant survivor who lost an eye during the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, makes his appearance again, a witness and a participant in the events. All along, he has continued to jot down his thoughts, the tumultuous times and the gruesome miseries of the ongoing war have brought a change of heart in him about Napoleon. He has also lost faith completely in the war. Quote, he thought he could always win battles the way he had always won battles, says Henri about Napoleon on page 80. 
Like a circus duck, he thought every audience would marvel at his tricks. But the audience was getting used to him. End of quote. For only the Russian campaign launched by Napoleon to consolidate his imperial power and grandeur has turned into an absurd show of cruelty and madness. Napoleon's mania for victory has blindfolded him completely as to the horrors of the war. There's only one exit of this abyss for Henri, and that is to abandon the campaign altogether. He has no respect for Napoleon anymore. To redeem his life and regain his sense of humanness, he has to retreat his steps back to the world he had known before, where people led ordinary lives. Villanelle will make her appearance just at the moment when he makes this decision. She was in the kitchen with Patrick eating what she could obtain of chicken legs. She was vivandière, a sort of attendant attached to a regimen selling spirits and other similar commodities and services. The sexual aspect of this association cannot be lost on the reader. In fact, Villanelle states that in her first address only on page 87, um, conveys this. That initial encounter defines the boundaries between them both. He is shy and reserved. She is brash and self-assertive. Only admits he fell in love with her at once. The journey back from Moscow will bring them even closer. Patrick, who joins them, soon falls ill and dies en route to Venice, along a trajectory of 1,300 kilometers amid the falling snow and freezing cold. What we learned during their, their protracted travel to the south are bits and pieces of their lives in the intervening period between 1805 and the year 1812. That gap in the narrative is now filled with alternating stories and flashes of their memories. As an example, the cook we have seen before resurges in Villanelle's life. She marries him and travels with him for two years and then steals his watch and money and roams for another year before she gets back to Venice. Eventually, he catches up with her and dares her to a game of cards that was rigged from the start. He decides to sell her to Murat, who is one of Napoleon's chief generals, to serve a vivandière in the French army. Henri's narrative, by contrast, focuses on the mundane and the present. It provides a chronological record of the journey and a cursory descriptions of the incidents taking place during their passage across Eastern Europe. This aspect of complementarity in the narrative is significant. It reflects their different temperaments and spirits. She is ingenuous and imaginative. imaginative. She loves adventure and can adapt fast to unusual circumstances. He's a down-to-earth individual, by contrast. He loves order and discipline. He has a strict sense of morality, duty, and decency. At one point, Patrick confronts him by saying, Domino was right about him, that he was a Puritan at heart didn't understand weakness and mess and simple humanness. End of quote, page 106. Remember how he is bewildered by the stories told by Patrick. He struggles to make sense of them, to accommodate them in his rational, fra rational frame of mind. The encounter between Villanelle and Henri then is a kind of climax in the novel. His innocence and placidity confronted with her passion and intensity. The encounter has mutual impact on them, both. It transforms them completely. His innocence will be disrupted forever as he gets trapped in her complicated life. She, in turn, will eventually assume a dignified demeanor when his emotions will run high and becomes wilder and more intense than hers. His stay in Venice was meant, a meant to be a short, temporary, affair. He had entertained a plan to go back to his village in France and follow the path of his parents. 
That seemed more reassuring and more certain than an adventurous life in a city of mazes like Venice. The only thread that connected him to this place was Villanelle. His affection for her weakened him and made him vulnerable. She liked him like a brother and couldn't imagine he could ignite her life and keep her passions awake. In her mother's words, Henri was, quote, too steady for her. She goes for madmen. I tell her to calm down, but she never will. She wants it to be pent cost every day. Page 122. In other words, she wants her life to be a string of parties and celebrations. In Venice, when she resumes her passion for drifting, um, we see how she creates confusion in the life of Henri. Henri, completely taken to her, incapable of controlling his emotion, follows her everywhere. When she goes to the casino, he feels uncomfortable and even revolted by the obscenities and sinfulness of the place. This certainly is a frontier he could never cross. I spoke briefly about the symbolic space of the casino in previous lecture, remember? Well, the casino is a, is a marginal world, contiguous to the world outside. It has its own peculiar vibe and rhythm. It is inhabited by disparate individuals who have wild passions for pleasure and fortune and pain, willing to sacrifice their lives, their peace of mind, for some identified, unidentified sort of reward. It is in the casino that she bumps into her husband, the villainous cook. The encounter changes fast into a violent incident and only inflamed by the accumulated rage against this old enemy, a common enemy, now intent on depriving him of his beloved woman, vents his fury in abhorrence and plunges a knife in his enemy's belly again and again. It is significant that only is not shocked by the act of murder he just committed but seems to derive a particular pleasure in remembering the process itself and even cutting a triangle in the cook's chest to take out his heart organ. An ironic sequel to the fantastic mission of Fitchin Villanelle's heart from the six-story building. The narrative ends with this graphic murder, a scene not unlike that described in Renaissance plays, Shakespeare's, for example. It will bring a radical change in Henri, a change both welcome and unexpected. The next lecture I will address this aspect of Henri's development as a character. Villeneuve will also be transformed by this event. Let us now return to the question I asked at the end of my previous lecture. In what way? In what way does the first two parts of the narrative prepare the reader for what comes later? Well, what makes this novel particularly interesting is the fact that we have two major characters who are also narrators. Aside from the broad historical context of the war and the ubiquitous presence of the cook, the two narratives evolve almost um, distinctly one from the other. They are like separate threads that would be woven together to form a cord or different streams that follow together from a river. When they merge, they create a powerful synergy, a sort of mosaic in which a uh, distinct part produce a fascinating compound effect. Question number two. How can we qualify the narration or storytelling in part one and two. Uh, the narrative pace uh, in each of these two parts is slow. Henri's and Villanelle's different worlds are portrayed in detail and, in, and, and so is their social and, and, and psychological makeup. The third part, separated by a gap of eight years, draws heavily on these elaborate sketches already presented in part one and two. The flow of event in part three is 
easy and the pace of narration is more fluid and quicker. I have observed earlier that um, the difference between Henri and Vellon is reflected in the objects of their narration, while Henri sticks to the facts and events as he observes and records them in his journal. Vellon is a dreamer and adventurer. Her world is defined by mystery and desire. Her entourage is not restricted, restricted to her own family, but stretches to include spaces and figures that are rather odd and intriguing. There are similar features, though notably the short sentences, the shifts from the past to the present and back to the past, the tableau-like narrative episodes. In other words, in both parts, we see brief sequences of narration intended to produce an image or portrait of a given moment in the past or the present. In the case of Henri, the mother-father relationship, the brothel scene, the coronation of Bonaparte, the same could be said about the part narrated by Villanelle. Think of the birth scene, the various casino scenes, the repeated meetings with the Queen of Spades. 